We're continuing uh, through Galatians. We're trying to get through it in a reasonable way. Um, we're going to finish up chapter 2 today. So that's good. So turn to Galatians if you have your Bibles. I hope you do. Galatians chapter 2. And we're going to take a section of Scripture where Paul, and he's just getting into the heart of his letter now. now this is where really it's all about this. Well, this is a, a huge part of this, what he's trying to teach his congregation, these congregations. And it's a distinction between law and gospel. Okay? Law and gospel. That's the, the big thing here. And he's going to do this from where we're starting today all the way through chapter 4. So these sermons are going to be, it's almost like a little mini-series within a series. Law and gospel. And this is just part one. So this, Paul's making a distinction. He wants to drive this home. It's an important point that you can't be saved by the things you do or that you try to do. Okay? But the laws and the rituals. So... And, and uh, pastors are going to read today, it's, it's a little complex, but we're going to try to make the complex simple this morning, if we can. Let's see. Okay, beginning in verse 15. Paul says this, We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ, not by the works of the law, because by the works of the law, no one will be justified. But if, our, if in our endeavor to be justified in Christ, we too are found to be sinners, is Christ then the servant of sin? Certainly not. For if I rebuild on what I tore down, I prove myself to be a transgression. Oh, sir. Through the law, I died to the law, so that I might live to God. I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who is in me. In the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and he gave himself for me. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. Okay, let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you and praise you for your precious word. And I pray, Lord, this morning uh, would be a time that you would open up our eyes and our hearts and our minds, illuminate us, Lord. I pray that you would be with me, give me your words to speak and help me to explain this, Lord in a way that um, honors you and helps us. So please, Lord, be with us we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, again, this is the heart of the letter. <clears throat> and Paul's big argument is like, look, you can't go to heaven by trying to keep the law or add to what Jesus already did. Okay, if you do that, and that was a problem because people were coming in and the church would say, believe in Jesus, but guess what, man, you also need to be circumcised to really be saved. No, Paul's really adamant against that. Um, say, no, we can't keep it. Justification is by faith alone. That's the call and cry of Protestant Christianity. I would say biblical Christianity. That justification is by faith alone. Now, the law does have its place. So the commandments, when I talk about the law, I'm mainly talking about the moral law of God codified in the Ten Commandments. So you can think of that. Think of the commandments. But it also extends to uh, different rituals that the Jews practiced before the time of Christ, the, the ceremonies, the sacrifices, those kinds of things. But mainly think about the commandments uh, in, in that regard, about keeping the law, doing things. The law has its place, for sure, but it's not about keeping. Please understand this. Christianity is never about keeping rules and, and rituals so that Jesus might, might love you, that he might be proud of you, that he might you know, kind of see that you're doing all right and give you a place. That's, we're so used to doing that, because in every other realm of life, that's what we do. We try hard, we work hard, we want to be noticed, we want the promotion. Yeah, and there's a place for that in life. <laughs> but when it comes to salvation, and this is the paradox of Christianity, this is what's so cool about Christianity, it's not like anything else. It's always different from what you think it should be like. You know, from, from our natural inclinations. That's where faith comes in, because we're believing in the Lord. Okay, so verse 15, Paul begins his argument here, and he says, look, we ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. He's talking about himself, he's talking about Peter and others, to mainly the Gentiles. Anybody who's not Jewish is considered Gentile. He says, listen, we ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. Right away, he starts with that. What he's saying is, um, even though the Jews had, I guess you could call them advantages in that way, they had the oracles of God. They were the, the, the people of God. They had the prophets. They had the promises. 
Right? They had the law. They had the ceremonies. All these things that, that pointed to God. While the, the Gentiles didn't have all that. They had natural revelation. They knew who God was from what he made and from how they are made in his image. But they didn't have everything that the Jews had. That's what Paul's saying here. He's not to say, we're Jews and we're good and you're just Gentile sinners. We're not like you bad people. His point is, listen, even though they had, even though Israel had all those advantages, they weren't saved by that. Okay? They weren't saved by keeping the ritual. They weren't saved just like the Gentiles. They needed Christ. You understand? That's the idea here. Both groups consist of sinners in need of grace. Salvation is always about grace. So Paul says, we ourselves are Jews by birth, not Gentile sinners. Yet we know. Now as Christians, even though we're raised in this culture as Jews, we know, Jewish believers say, that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith alone. And that is a big deal. Obedience to the law doesn't save. Let that sink in. Please, please, Christian. And obedience to the law doesn't help you keep your salvation either. Do you understand? If you're a Christian this morning, you have to understand that. There's a place for the law. We're going to talk about that in just a moment in our lives as Christians. But don't think that you have to keep that so you lose your salvation. Or that God will love you more in, in some way. He can't love you any more than he already does. He showed that at the cross of Christ. Okay? And by keeping the rules, you're not going to earn special merit for him. And if you don't keep the law, and when you do so, it doesn't mean you're going to lose your salvation either. Do you understand that? That's something very important for us to get. We persevere because he preserves us. He'll never leave us or forsake us. So, because we can have a tendency as Christians to kind of keep the law in that way, to maintain our salvation type of thing, right? Or to get a little higher. We don't do that. That's what's unique about Christianity. That's what's so cool about Christianity, that it has nothing to do with the law. All the other religions, all the other philosophies, I've mentioned this before, I'm going to mention it again, have something to do with you, right? Right now in our country, um, there's more and more of an Islamic influence, right? Islam is, is, is all around us more and more, and it's more prevalent um, than it used to be for sure. But do you know that every person in Islam is basically responsible for their salvation? If I just do this? Hello? Did I just die you? My battery is dead, isn't it? I'm going to be off and on. <laughs> I want to change the battery out. I'll just talk louder when it goes out. Um, if you're a Muslim, everything or so much of salvation depends on you. Do you know there's at least five things that have to do the five pillars of Islam? And this is just to, to, to talk to you about your involvement in salvation. You're doing something. And that's the tendency. That's what we want to do all the time, is to do something in terms of our salvation. So for Islam, there's five pillars of Islam, things that they have to do in order to maybe, perhaps, get to heaven. How would you like that? <laughs> you know, listen, if you're good enough, if you try this hard enough, if you do this, then maybe, perhaps, you'll go to heaven. But what are the five things? Just real quick. Number one is Sha'ada. That is sincerely reciting the Muslim profession. And that is this. Now, you have to do it in Aramaic. I can't do it in Aramaic. I'll just do it in English. But to be an official Muslim, this is what makes you a Muslim. Okay? Not just coming under conviction, but reciting this profession. There is one true God. I'm sorry. There is no true God but Allah, and Muhammad is the prophet of God. There is no true God but Allah, and Muhammad is the prophet of God. If you say that sincerely, guess what? You're a Muslim. Let's see if we're back online. So that's number one. Number two is Salat, and that is ritual prayers. So you know that a Muslim prays five times a day, right? It must be more than the batteries. Wait, maybe I'm good. Am I, am I back on? We're back online. Okay, cool. Okay. Number two is Salat. Those are the ritual prayers. So if you're Muslim, you know five times a day you need to bow towards Mecca and pray. That's something you have to do. That's required of you to maybe, perhaps, get into heaven and be with God. Maybe. Just, just the opportunity. If you don't do it, forget about it. Do you see this? Do you see the difference between salvation by grace alone and not by working for it? Number three 
is zakat, and that's paying alms to help the poor. Every Muslim is required to give a percentage of uh, his income to go towards good works to help the poor and the needy. That's a good thing. So these, these aren't necessarily bad things. So you believe in your God, pray to your God five times a day, no matter where you're at, you get down and you pray as you face towards Mecca. Give alms to help poor and needy. Not bad. So these are kind of good things you do. Sawam so is the fourth, and that's fasting during the month of Ramadan, which is kind of interesting if you read about it. But anyway, it's, it's a required fast during a holy month. Okay, and that, and that helps. This is just required. And then Hajj, which is a pilgrimage to Mecca, if you're able to do that. You don't necessarily have to, um, but if you're, if, if you're not able to do it for certain reasons, that's, you know, you're kind of exempt from that. But these are the five pillars. So if you're a Muslim, see this? I have to do this. I can do this. If I do this, then maybe, perhaps, I'll be with God. And then there's other things you know, that, that, are, that, that you can do to almost assure that you'll be in the presence of the Lord, okay? that, or, or, of Allah, of God, in that way. But I just wanted to bring this up because that's exactly what Paul is not talking about here. Okay? A person is saved by grace alone, through faith alone, and Jesus Christ alone. That is the cry of the Protestant Reformation. That was with Martin Luther. When he was reading Galatians and Romans and some of the Psalms, that's what made him question so much of what was being taught in the Roman church because of what they had to do to maintain their salvation. Well, here's what you have to do, and here's what you have to pray, and, here's, and then maybe at some point you'll be in heaven after you're done with purgatory. And if you think about it, it's, it's almost per it's kind of close to, to Islam because you're, you're working to maintain or hoping that you get. That's not what Christianity teaches. And, and Luther saw that, and that's really what started to change his mind and move towards the Protestant Reformation, which we come from. This is why our church is a product of, of the Reformation. We believe in the person and work of Christ, that's it, of Jesus on our behalf. We're justified, not by our own law-keeping. That was never, ever God's plan. We're going to talk more about that next week. It was never the plan, not even in the Old Testament. It wasn't about them trying hard and doing what they were supposed to do, that they might get into heaven, that they might please God. It was never about that. It was always about a promise that God would send His Son, okay, to bruise the head of the Son, to gain salvation to His people. That's what Scripture is all about. If you're my one in that Bible class, you know that. We're going, it's good in that way. So, no one's justified by works of the law. But that doesn't mean that there's no use for the law in our lives. In our lives. You understand? We can't do anything regarding the law of God to make God love us, to give us salvation, to give us that hope. But the law does have a place in our lives. Look at verses 17 through 19. Here's what it's a little complicated in this passage. But if in our endeavor to be justified in Christ, we too were found to be sinners, is Christ then the servant of sin? Certainly not. If I rebuild what I tore down, I prove myself to be a transgressor. Okay? That's a really hard passage <laughs> to, to decipher, to get through. Because Paul uh, changes the subject a little bit. But listen, here's what he's saying. Here was a big fear of the Judaizers, the people that wanted you to do more in order to be saved. They were afraid, since you are saved by grace and nothing else, if what Paul was teaching is really true, that's it, if it's just grace alone, then how can that be? Isn't, isn't that going to lead to sin? If we're just saved, by, if there's nothing, if it's not about keeping the law of God, what's going to stop us from sinning and say, yeah, I believe in Jesus, you understand? And that's all it takes. I trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, and now I can live as I want to. See, that was a big fear of the Judaizers. That's a big fear of a lot of people, because that freedom that we have in Jesus Christ, to say there's nothing we can do by way of the law in order to be saved or maintain our salvation. So the big concern is, or the accusation is, well, then I'm free to sin. Does that, and Paul's saying that, look, if we are attempting to be justified in Christ, we too are found to be sinners, because we still live in sin and need to repent, does that make Christ a servant of sin? Is it okay with Jesus for us? Uh, does he really save us? But then does he say it's okay for us to keep on sinning because we're Christians and can't lose our salvation? That's a big problem for a lot of people. That's a big concern. And that's sometimes a problem in the church. It's called antinomianism, where there's no law. Hey, I am free to do what I want. Now that I'm a Christian, I can basically live the way I want to live, and I'm forgiven. Right? It's called grace. That's it. And there's a, 
a big concern in different parts of the church today. It's called the hyper grace movement, and that's exactly what they're teaching. They're saying, look, if you're a Christian, it doesn't matter if you sin really. I can have my cake and eat it too. I can do what I want because I'm saved in Jesus and I can live the way I want to. Is that what Paul is saying here? What these guys are afraid of? No, that's right, Scott. He says, no, certainly not. May it never be. It doesn't make Christ the servant of sin. No, it does not do that. So we live for him. Listen, when God gave the law, there are different aspects of it. I explained this on Wednesday night. So if you're there on Wednesday night, there's going to be a little bit of a repeat for you as well. We kind of overlap a lot, right, Michelle? <laughs> you can see that. That's not necessarily a bad thing. But listen, there are three primary uses of the law of God. When you think about the law of God, think of three primary uses if you want to write this down. Number one, the first thing about the law, especially the moral law of God, you can kind of think of the Ten Commandments if you like. The first thing about that is to curb or to restrain evil. That's the first use of the law of God. So through that fear of punishment, it keeps a sinful nature in check as it were, right? It restrains evil. But in and of itself, it can't do anything to change the human heart. So you can't keep the law and expect to gain anything from God. All the law does, or one of the aspects of the law, is to restrain that evil. So if you're, we always use the illustration about driving, okay? If the speed limit's 55, how fast are you gonna go? You'll go 60. Don't say it, Luke. 80? <laughs> no, he didn't say it. But, but if you know that, you know, if, you, you're, if you're doing 75, you're kind of pushing it. And if there's a police officer, see, it's to restrain. So that law's going to make you think about it. You still might go over and transgress, but at least you're going to think about it. And when you take this out, and check this out, when you take this aspect of the law out of a society, you're going to see it start to unravel because there's a real use to that restraining, that fear, that fear of God, that fear of punishment. Okay, this is the law. There, there's a part of that to, to curb um, or restrain evil. But even in our country, think about it. And I don't, I'm not going to be legalistic about this, but certainly that aspect of the law has, has by and large been taken out. If you're a little bit older, you remember when you saw the Ten Commandments just about everywhere you went. I still remember the Ten Commandments in grade school, right? Okay? and all around our society, but take those out, what do you have? You have more lawlessness. You have much more disrespect for law and law enforcement and law abiding citizens because that tends to, when the laws aren't there, when there's nothing to restrain you, man, if the teacher's out of the room, what are you gonna do? <laughs> You're gonna start throwing everything, the erasers, right? You're not restrained anymore. That's what he's talking about here. That's the idea of the first use of the law. You take that restraint out, you're gonna be who you are, <laughs> more or less. You know? You're gonna tend towards that. And, that's, and, that, and we can see that, and it, and it kind of, because there's a selfishness to that, and there's not a fear of any repercussions, and so it kind of just leads to, to lawlessness and to, and to chaos, and a breakdown even in civility, in respect for one another, respect for the laws. I think you can see that even in our nation today, if you're a little bit older, you can look back, where those commandments are taken out, so it's not really restraining. Nobody's afraid anymore. Nobody's afraid of God. Nobody's afraid of officers. Nobody's afraid of the law. They're just doing what they want to do. Part of that is because this has been taken out, okay, by and large. So, first use of the law is to curb, to restrain evil. Second use of the law, it serves as a mirror, and this is really important. We're going to talk about it uh, a little bit more next time as well, but it serves as a mirror. So you look at the law as if you're looking to a mirror, and on the one hand, it reflects, the law reflects, when you think about the Ten Commandments, just think of that for right now, what does it reflect? What does it tell you about God? It tells you that He's holy. Right? It tells you that he's righteous. That's, that's what this tells you. It tells you that's the standard of perfection okay, that we can never meet. So it speaks to his holiness. It tells us much about God, and these commandments flow from his nature. It's not that God's different and says this, this, this. This is who he is. And so these commandments flow from his very nature. Understand? So the Ten Commandments do that. So they show us and mirror who God is. On the other hand, and this is very important for us. The law teaches us not that if we keep it, we could achieve something from God. 
but it teaches us about our sinfulness and our inability to keep it. Do you understand that? Please, get this down. This is part of the reason God gave us that the law and the commandments, is to show us, not if we keep it that he's going to love us, but that we can't keep it, so we run to him. When you look at the commandments, when you look at the law of God, you should be driven to Christ. You should say, look, I can't do this. No matter how hard I try, I could try harder, I could do better, I could hope to be better. No. When you see the commandments and you really take a look at your own heart, you come to the realization, I can't do this. That's part of what the law is there, is to break you, to show that you can't live up to the standard. You can't meet the demands. So stop trying. Because Jesus did. That's exactly what Jesus did. He kept every commandment perfectly for you. So when you think you can do something, what are you saying about Jesus? You're not enough. You're insufficient. Right? So the law tells us, no, Jesus meets the demands. It was perfect, sinless life. He is the law keeper on our behalf. You get this? This is really important because it goes against our tendency to try to keep, to try to earn. As Christians, we're justified by grace. We're saved from God's wrath, sin, Satan, death, and hell. Amen. That's it. You have a new heart, a new life, and new hope. So, far from feeling to live as I please, like the Judaizers were afraid, look, if there's no law, if you don't have to do this, you don't have to do that, then you can do whatever you want, then God's going to love you anyway. No, that's not how we think as Christians. The way we think, the way we believe, is because Christ has done this for us. I don't have to keep it so he'll love me, but because he loves me, I want to live this way for him. Does that make sense? Not, and that's a mentality change for a lot of us, because we almost think we have to strive, we have to try. No, he's already done it for us, and because of that, I want to do it for him. So it comes out of love, it comes out of gratitude. Right? I don't feel, hey, I get to go sin all I want. God loves me. I'm forgiven. No, I feel my sin deeper, and I want to live for him because of what he has done for me. Right? So we're living in freedom not to sin, but to obey him. And that's where the law changes for us. That's the third use of the law, is it becomes a guide for us now. Right? I'm not trying to keep it, to be saved. I don't hate it because I want to go against it. I love it because he kept it for me, and this is how I want to live. So, in Psalm 119, verse 72 to 74, the law of your mouth is better to me. This is the psalmist. This is what he says about God's law. Than thousands of gold and silver pieces. Your hands have made and fashioned me. Give me understanding that I may learn your commandments. I want to know them now. Those who feared you shall see me and rejoice because I have hope in your word. And then Psalm 19, 9 and 10. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord, that's that the law of God is true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. And then John 14, 21, Jesus says this. Whoever has my commandments. Do you have his commandments? Whoever has my commandments and what? Keeps them. See, this is where we get confused. Oh, if you have my commandments and keep them, you know, then I'm going to what? No. This is as Christians. If you have his commandments and you love them as a Christian who loves them, he will be loved. I'm sorry. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. Do you know, do you know how you love Jesus? Not to earn him. Not so he'll love you, but because he loves you. How do you love him? That you love the commandments. That you love the law, that you love his word in that way. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father. I will love him and I will manifest myself to him. Do you understand? The law is not something I hate. It's not something we try to keep to earn or merit. But now, the law becomes a guide. It reveals to us what pleases him. Right? The commandments. We live in light of these I want to love the Lord. I want to do what God wants me to do. Don't you? Don't you love, don't you love the commandments now? So even think of the commandments. That they're not these things that stand against us. I can never meet this. Yes, you can't. That's, a, that's right. You can't. Christ has. But now as a Christian, I want to love you more than anything else. I don't want to have any of the gods before me. 
but I know in my heart that I do. So even when I do, I repent, I bring that before you, and you forgive me and you love me. You know, I, I want to love my wife as I ought to. But even when I don't, I go to him with repentance and, forg and with forgiveness in him. See, that's what they become now for us. I don't want to be a thief. I don't want to do, do that anymore. I want to live for you. That's what he's talking about here. It's not that we, as we're endeavoring to be justified in Christ, that we can live any way we like and Christ becomes the, the master of sin. No, no, not at all. That's not true. Now that we have a proper understanding of the law, we can live for him through it. Do you understand? We don't throw away the law. We don't live the way we want to. We don't. Now we love it. And it's our guide as Christians to live for him. Then in verse 18 he says this, For if I rebuild what I tore down, I prove myself to be a transgressor. What's he saying there? He's, a, he's not saying, I'm not, we're not going to go back to using the law the way we used to. He can't go back to the way it used to be, salvation by keeping the commandments, by being circumcised, by doing all those things. No, I'm saved by faith alone. I'm not going to go back and rebuild that because then I will be wrong. Here's the proper use of the law. And then he goes on in verse 20. And this is some of the greatest verses in all the scripture. <laughs> my, one of my favorite scripture, I know Luke loves it too, in this way. Uh, Galatians 2, beginning in verse 20, says this. I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not nullify the grace of God. For if righteousness were through the law, then Christ would have died for no purpose. Again, one of the greatest verses in Scripture. What he's saying is this. When Jesus Christ, who kept the law that I couldn't, when he died, my guilt was given to him. That's it. Because I believe in him and his righteousness was given to me. That's what he's saying. That's the, that's the idea. I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live. That when he died, all my sins were on him, his righteousness to me. And what he's saying in a very practical way, he says, I've been crucified with Christ. Have you been crucified with Christ? If you're a Christian, you have been. Okay? He made him who knew no sin to become sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of Christ in him. From 2 Corinthians 5, 21, absolutely. But what it means on a practical level, and I want you to get this, when he says, I've been crucified with Christ, it's no longer I who live. The implication of that is that my old life is over. That I am done. I'm done. I'm done with myself. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not the person I used to be. And that's the change that he makes. That's what he's saying there when he comes into your heart. It's not a free ticket to go and sin and to live as I want and still be saved. No. It's like I'm done for. I'm, I'm done with me. I'm done with my sinful ways. That's the attitude. Yeah, we're still going to sin and go back and, and repent. But the, but the idea is I, I'm, I'm over. It's, it's, I want Christ. He is my life now. I don't want to be characterized. I don't want to be dominated by the things I used to be characterized by and the things that used to dominate me. That's not who I am anymore in Christ. I don't want to be known for my greed or my pride or my lust or my anger. Or my, or my fear. That's not who I am in Christ. I want to be so controlled by Him that, that His ways become my ways. Do you understand? That's, what, that's, the, that's the heart of what He's saying there. I want to live in a very intentional way as Christ would have me live. That's the idea. And He expounds on this very fact. If you just turn the page uh, in, in chapter 5, and we'll talk much more about this, but what I'm saying is, when he says, and this is what, what you have to ask yourself, in, in Christ, am I done with myself? Have I been crucified with Christ? Do I really want to do it his way? Or am I still living the way I always used to live? I just kind of, you know, gloss it over. Or am I truly living for him? Or am I still that same old person underneath? Right? That's a big deal because it has to do with your salvation. Because when he changes you, man, you truly change. You really do. Because he changes you. You're not that person you used to be. So he says this in the fruit of the Spirit. Check this out. Beginning in verse 16 of chapter 5. He says, walk by the Spirit. Do not gratify the desires of the flesh. The desires of the flesh against the Spirit. The desires of the Spirit against the flesh. These are opposed to one another to keep you from doing the things that you want. Again, when we get to this, we'll expound on it. 
But this is a parallel to what Paul's saying when he said, I've been crucified with Christ. You're not, but if you are led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual morality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger. See, that's who I used to be. That's who I used to be. That, that characterized me. These things dominated me. This is what I was like before Christ. That's the flesh. Envy, drunkenness, orgies, things like this. I warn you before that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God, but the fruit of the Spirit. This is, this is what characterizes me. This is what I want to be known for. This is what I want to project. This is, this is who I am in Christ. The fruit of the Spirit is love, it's joy, it's peace, it's patience, it's kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things are no, there is no law. Do you understand? It's not living about the way I want to live. It's living under His dumb, under His control and under His power. There's no law against that if I'm living the way He wants me to. If we're living for Him, right? And that's what he's saying in this way. He doesn't nullify the grace of God like the Judaizers or anyone else who would add to the finished work of Christ. Paul's not adding to it at all. Be crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Can you say that in your heart? Is that seen in your life? He goes on and says this. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. Paul doesn't add anything to salvation like the other people were trying to do. He says, no. There's a place for the law in the Christian's life, absolutely, but it's not to do with salvation. If I do that, and the seriousness is seen in this statement when he says, then Christ died for no purpose. If, any, if salvation is not by grace alone, if there's something that we do, anything that we do, to add or try to merit, try to gain in any way, if anything else is deemed necessary, then Christ would have died for nothing. That's why this is so important. That's why Paul's so out of it. Because if we could say, I did this, I did this little thing, I obeyed in this area, and God loved me, then we nullify the work of Jesus on the cross. That his death means nothing. He paid it all. He paid the full price. And if we say that we've done something to earn that or add it to it, we're saying, Jesus, you, you've done nothing at all. Really. You want this because he has done it all. If we say, no, 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 not all, most, but not all, we rob him of that Lord. This text defines biblical Christianity. This is what Christianity is all about. This verse, these verses explain the uniqueness of the gospel message. The idea of salvation by grace apart from works is unique because it rests upon God, God alone, 